The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. So Ben, what are we doing today? In today's episode, we're going to be finishing up the Atari Junk keyboard. Mm. In our previous episode, we took apart the keyboard and made a manually activated switch matrix with it so we could read all the keys, even though they were matrix, okay. without using microcontrollers. In this episode, we're going to take those outputs and hook them up to a 555 array so we can actually create the Atari sound effects. We've got a lot of wiring to do. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Oh, look, I knocked some hot glue loose. Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Hey, a Forrest Mims drawing. I remember reading his books when I was a kid. Yep, Forrest Mims, pretty cool guy. He's like the ultimate maker, mm -hmm. or the original maker. Mm -hmm. So this is the Atari Jump Console circuit with two 555s. Five five mm -hmm. Now you got a bunch of 556s, five five which is just two 555s five five in one package. Right. So that will save some time. Mm -hmm. But you're thinking that we should get polyphony by putting a 555 five five on every key. Right, yeah. But we, would we need both on every key or just one? No, we'd only need one because we have we could take this mm -hmm. and put that into the trigger of all of them. Oh, yeah, because one of these drives the frequency. Well, tone is frequency. One of these drives like the saw wave, and the other one drives the tone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we could just have uh, 48 of these mm -hmm. and one of those. Or six of these, so we could put a different effect in every octave. Yeah, yeah. Because this would be what the effect is and this would be what the note is. Right. So we'd have six of these and 48 of these. Mm -hmm. So all of the dual package 555s five, five, that you got are actually not going to be used if we do it that way. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, do we have, what is that? We have 54 uh, op amps laying around? Um, 48 plus six. We could just, couldn't we just take the output and put them all together? Oh, we, how would we put the outputs together? Oh, we would use resistors. We oh, have, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like we can have like, a, oh, I don't know what it'd be, like a 4K yeah. resistor. Yeah, we sum the outputs with resistors, although that's a lot of outputs. Because when it's not active, it might pull the output low. So that's mm -hmm. something to think about. Sure. So these are the transistors that are going to allow my switch matrix to activate mm -hmm. the 555 circuit. All right, you see these three right here? Mm -hmm. These three pins right here are yep. going to the uh, base of these three transistors. Yep. So you're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, it's actually it's like going this way and then that way. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. okay. Oh, you know, yeah, that probably would be better. <laughs> yeah, go zero, one, two, three, four, five, 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 like. Well, that. since we got to have forty-seven of these, I'm gonna. It gonna would be, be less wiring because by the time you get to this side, there's gonna be a lot of wiring piling up. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. The whole this thing is all, is yeah, this, this is all gonna be transistors. It's gonna look like an old computer. Well, that's cool. <laughs> um, so you have to do this no matter what. Yeah. So why don't you finish this up and then we'll do a polyphony test. Okay. Well, I want to. I want to test these ones that I have connected oh, so far okay. just to make sure that it's all going And then right. we'll do the polyphony test? Yeah. Okay, so Felix is going to continue working on that. I'm going to chop the keyboard in half and try to get that part figured out. And then we're also going to do some experiments to see if we can get single key polyphony with our cool keyboard. Felix is laser cutting a panel that we can attach potentiometers to. We're going to have one of these panels per octave and he's attaching the potentiometers to the 555 timers so we can adjust the frequency of each key individually. There's a lot of wiring to do in this part of the episode, so Felix and I have split up the tasks. I am going to wire up the bank of 556s and 555s. So this board will sit on top of the transistor array that Felix is wiring, and there'll be this header here interfacing it. So this is the 555 that drives each octave, and then here are six 556s, which is just two 555s in one package. So this will be one octave, six times two, 12 different notes. So when you're wiring things like this, you want to think about the orientation of the chips, where they're going to attach, you know, where all the wires are. And in this case, the package of the 555 is pretty typical. You got the power here and the ground down here. So what I usually like to do is wire up the power bus first because that way it's below everything else. Otherwise it's kind of cumbersome when you have to add that last. And that allows you to make nice thick traces. So what I'd like to do, like with this power bus here, so I'll take these leads that I snip off of other things like resistors and capacitors, and I'll use them to create my circuits. I guess it's kind of like recycling or something. So you use them kind of like wires, but you lay them down like a circuit. You try to do everything in layers that don't intersect each other. 
So you put on one side and then you do the other. That way you can lay it flat. Otherwise it'll spring up with this memory since it's a wire. And you know, depending on the lengths of your wires or the size of your chips, sometimes you have to you know, wire it differently. So in this case, I think what I can do is I can take this, attach it to the power there. Now I'll bend it just like that. Then I'll push it down. This one's laying pretty flat. So then I'll tap the end of it. And then I'll go back and push it down again, make sure it's as flat and flush as possible. And then to connect these two wires, I could, you know, cheaply bridge them with solder, or I could just use, nah, I might be able to bridge them with solder. It's not really the proper way to do it, but it would work. In this case, I don't think it's gonna work. So I guess I'm gonna do it properly. Darn it, I hate doing things properly. That's for like the man, man. So I'm gonna take that, put it against it like that, lift this up. Now one thing about cutting the wires too short is they'll heat up quickly and then you'll cause both ends to detach when you heat it. When you have a longer wire, the wire can hold more heat, which means it stays in place better, which can be good and bad. It's usually good though. Whereas a short wire, you heat up the solder on it, the whole thing moves and it slides around. Whereas these long wires, one side's already been tacked, so it's not gonna move. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna complete that down this side and this side for power, and then do the opposite over here for ground. That way we'll have nice, convenient power and ground rails that are close to all the pins. That way when I actually wire up the 555 circuit, anything that has to go to ground, which is quite a few things actually, has a very short path and fewer wires. So always wire your power rails first. I'm going to be using small bits of wires that I've cut off of resistors, capacitors, and other things in order to make the power rails. First, I attach them at a right angle to the integrated circuit, solder them in place, and then bend them using my tweezers at right angles to go up and down the length of the chip. All right, check it out. I've got all of the positive rails connected to each other. Then on the other side, I have all the negative rails connected. See how I have them laid out so they don't intersect? And they also go down here to the single 555. Now that I have these beefy power wires connected, I can put all the signal traces over them. I've also labeled them. So our input keys are gonna go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, blah, blah, blah. So I label them so on the right side here is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. The next thing I'm gonna do is add the trigger wires which come from the circuit board that Felix is making. I'm gonna actually probably put those on top just so I have everything neat and clean. And then I'll do the rest of the wiring on the bottom. So time to get started. The header has the outputs from Felix's transistor matrix and I'm putting the inputs into each one of these timers. Each one of these integrated circuits has two 555 timers on it, which should hopefully give us 12 different notes you can play simultaneously. Felix's idea was to have every key be an individual sound, which is cool. It's just gonna take a lot of wiring. So this is one fourth of it. We have a drive 555 here, which sends a frequency into these 12 555 timers, and the outputs get summed here for the left and right channel. So each key will be left and right channel. That way we can just kind of have a little bit of separation and it'll basically be stereo. So how I did everything was I created all these buses here. There's a power bus, ground bus, and they intersect. And then signals such as reset and uh, ground I was able to jump over. So see these little lines right here? That jumps over the reset line for each of the 555s. Five then I also have one master line here for all of the trigger inputs because all 12 of these are triggered the same. So I took the trigger output of this single 555 and I put it into its own bus over here. And then that goes to each one of the other triggers because they all all interconnected. So all 12 of them will be triggered at the same rate. And then depending on what button you're, you're pressing, that's the sound you'll hear. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's a lot of wiring and work to do. So Felix and I are gonna do just the first 12. And he's also working on the uh, PNP transistor portion of this. But if this works, then we'll continue it and wire up the whole keyboard this way. But if it doesn't work, uh, we can you know, change course. Oh, and there's a connector here. This is the adjustment potentiometer and that will be on the keyboard. There'll be four of them, one per octave. And you can adjust that to say, okay, that's the kind of sound effect these 12 notes are going to make. So anything that's, for, you know, external like the potentiometer, I'm gonna put a connector for. So I'm mixing the audio by having these uh, 470 ohm resistors. So we go from the timer to, through the resistor and then into the bus. And then I'll actually use more resistors to tie each of the four buses to each other. So there'll be 
two levels of mixing, which means it'll need more ampl amplification to be aud audible, but that shouldn't be too big of an issue. This is just about ready. I need to connect an external pot and then we can plug this into the board Felix made and see if it actually works. And then if it does, even more wiring. We hooked up the first 12 notes of the system and now we're testing it out. It seems to kind of work. It's really quiet though. That's because we're going through resistors yeah. to mix the audio. It'll actually get quieter because I'm gonna mix all four banks as well. But you wanted all these individual notes so we can play. We can play every note at the same time if we wish. Let's take a look at this old test unit here. These sharps and flats oh, okay. aren't connected. No, this seems, well, I mean, aside from the fact that it's louder, which is because we don't have it going through a resistor mm -hmm. ladder. I mean, this seems at a lot, this seems to be working better than our overly complicated solution. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that we hooked up the 555s in the wrong way. The one that we were supposed to use for frequency, we we're using for effects. So Felix is gonna switch around the circuit on this test board so we can figure out quickly if we made a mistake and then adjust our main board in accordance with that theory. So right now it's a hypothesis and this will be a theory. Because a theory is more advanced than a hypothesis. Okay, Felix switched the circuit around. Now we're using these potentiometers and these switches to drive the frequency, and then this is the master effects control. Soon we'll be able to talk to aliens. See, we can get the same results, we just have to change the scale of the potentiometers. So when you push two at a time, it sums them and creates a lower note. Mm -hmm. We could just say that's a feature. Okay, Felix, I guess the next question is, how do we rework this to replace this board? We can probably do it with a lot less circuitry, right? So what do you want to do? do well, you wanna... the same signals that are coming, these voltage divisions are the same as the ones you built over here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the, signals, the same signals that are coming off of this could easily go to this. Mm -hmm. um, but then the question is, yeah, you have, how is this wired exactly? Like this? Well, not like this. Well, right, but you have multiple inputs going into the into the 555. You have them in parallel? They're all going into here. So you basically have a bunch of, like if you were to draw it out, you have a bunch of parallel potentiometers. Mm -hmm. Like this, like one after the other. Okay, how about this? Can you draw that out and then we can figure out the best way to proceed? Yeah. Just draw out a couple of them so I get the, the idea. Because we may have to approach this differently. So yeah, we can rebuild this one. So we need to switch this around. So we already have the potentiometers hooked up to these transistors. So we're getting different amounts of voltage mm -hmm. here. So we just basically have to rebuild this, but we can make it much simpler. So we basically make this circuit here, and then we use this as the input, and this is the effects potentiometer. Right. All right, cool. This timer board should be a lot simpler than the first one that I made, but I'm still going to attach the same kind of nice and neat power rails as I did before. I started rewiring the timer board. It's actually a lot simplified. We only need eight 555s or four 
combo 5.56s. Another thing I realized is we actually don't need all these headers. Um, we can hook up 12 of the transistors to the inputs. But we've already hooked up this, so I guess we'll continue using this. Although I'll have to remind Felix of that so he doesn't have to add more wires than he actually has to. Because the transistors will select what voltage goes on the output pin, but then all of those pins will go into a single input on each 555 timer. So again, I've hooked up power and ground rails, and those both go to these headers, which connect to the lower board. So I've got uh, two of the 556s on. I'll just get one wired up. So we're gonna have one of them be the frequency driver, and the other one is the effects driver, and then we'll have a single output from each one of these, and then we'll combine those into a left-right audio circuit. Time for some wiring fun. Okay, we redid the circuit, and now we just have two 555s per octave. And uh, we actually don't need all of these connections here because we sum all the outputs of the transistors together, and then whatever transistor is saturated, that's what voltage goes to the 555. So both of us did way more work than was probably necessary. All right, let's, do, let's give it a test. It's kind of quiet because we, we're not amplifying it yet. I'm gonna adjust Go the pot. Which one? Zero? So there's one potentiometer for every key, which is the note or the frequency. And then each of the four octaves has an effect potentiometer. And that's what Felix is working with his right hand. So I think we should continue wiring it in this fashion. Okay, status report, where are we? All right, it looks like you've got that board pretty much in hand. Yep. Oh, it's, it's exactly in your hand, yeah. Yeah, now it's in my hand. I've got this one in hand. All right, so we got four Atari junk consoles here and we have a, uh, left and right audio bus. Okay. So since I've got this part done before this, I guess I'll start working on the amplifier. Okay. And what do you have? On here, I've got uh, one row of interfaces for the keyboard matrix going into here right. and connected to the potentiometers. But now I've got two more that are on here. I need right. to wire them up and then I have to make a fourth one as well. All right, so we need to add one more row of transistors here. Yep. And, and then we have to build three more of these. Yep. But at least you don't have to individually wire them here. We can right. just tie all the collectors together mm -hmm. and then have one connection. So we have way more plugs than we need because we only have one, two, three, four for each octave. Yeah. All right. So if you want to continue working on that, mm -hmm. I will add an amplifier to this. That okay. way we can still work in parallel. Cool. Uh, as for this, um, are we gonna, we're going to want to mount these someplace, right? Yeah. Maybe like, you know, like one, two, three, four. Or do you want it to be along the back of the yeah, keyboard? Yeah, right along. So you'd, each knob goes to each key. Okay. Well, of, as you're wiring it, make sure that you have enough cable to accomplish that. So keep, keep the physicality of this in mind. So this is probably going to be underneath the keys. So these could be shorter, but that one would need to be longer. All right. All right. Let's get back to work. Okay, I'm wiring up this TP6021A4 audio amplifier. I've used this in the past. I have a bunch of them laying around. I like it because it's pretty easy to hook up. You don't need that many external components. It has a easy potentiometer volume control. It works in stereo. One volume knob works for both channels and you can run it off five volts. So I've connected it to the left and right rails here and I have it going to some plugs which we can hook up to speakers. Yeah, and I think I pretty much have everything wired. I'll just double check the diagrams. And then once I've got that done, we can test it using the circuit that Felix is working on. So I just have to add a volume knob and I think that's pretty much it. We had some problems. I may have dead shorted the power supply, which killed the crystal that was driving the keyboard matrix, so I replaced it. But now we've got some funky tunes going. Oh yeah. You know, people probably thought harpsichord sounded pretty dumb when they were invented. What are the next steps, Felix? Uh, I think next we'll need to see if, uh, are these still disconnected, these three? Yes, they're connected to the left and right bus. Mm -hmm. How many more transistors have you added? All 47 transistors are on that board. I just need to add 12 more resistors. Okay, so then we're gonna connect the next 12 here, the next 12 here, and the next 12 here. Mm -hmm. That should give us full range of the keyboard. These three are actually already connected. Oh! I just need that to connect this last one. Okay, so we need to make three more of these. And three more of these, and I gotta add the 12 more resistors, and then connect these two banks to the input from the keyboard. Oh, okay, so there's a lot more wiring to go. Yeah. Okay, so Felix is gonna continue working on the wiring. I'm going to make him some more effects knobs, and then I'm gonna start working on the enclosure for this. Since it seems to be working, it just takes more time and wiring to finish. Mm -hmm. 
Now it's time to make the enclosure for the Atari Junk Keyboard. I'm using the CNC machine to cut half inch MDO, medium density overlay, basically plywood with paper over it. And then once I have that done, I'm going to screw and glue the pieces together and clamp a few things to make sure everything stays nice and straight. Once that's done, we're going to give it a coat of white base paint and then we're going to use a laser cutter to make cool custom patterns with pieces of paper that we can use as stencils to make this thing look like it was dipped in liquid 80s. We've also got these pretty funky Cheeto shaped saved by the bell shapes that we're going to spray onto the unit as well. Wow, Funkadelic rad. Okay, quick overview of the parts inside of this keyboard. We have the left and right speakers, individual potentiometers for every key, four octave potentiometers, all of our circuitry all piled up, tons of wiring. I think this might be the most wiring we've ever done for a single project. Yes, even more than those hand-wired computers we've done in the past. Power amplifier, uh, power coming in from the wall, voltage power supply for the five volt logic, and then our audio cable. All right, I'm just gonna button this up, drill a hole in the side for the volume jack, and then we can test it out. Well, Karen, we finished the Atari Junk Keyboard. It's looking pretty sweet. It looks like it was dipped in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Let's test it out. Wait, I heard there was a great 80s cover band in town. Maybe we should let them do it. Yeah, that makes more sense. Let's get out of here. We are Glasphemer, the most epic band that ever was epically epic. We're here today to play a song about the way our souls feel about the 1980s, the decade from which we spawned. He-Man, She-Ra, DuckTales, Gummy Bears, Iran-Contra Affair. Radical. 1983! Jim Socks, Mary Lou Retton, Ronald Reagan, Pan Am Airlines went bankrupt, and then something with Iran. Fruit Loops. 1987! My soul is a heap of garbage in the satellite of your love. Pac-Man. We came from the 80s with Jimmy Carter, and we left with another George Bush. Jet Aeroplane. Then the Berlin Wall came crashing to the ground. Can you hear the sound of freedom all around? Star Wars, the controversial missile defense system, not the movie. Thank you, and good night. Wow, that was uh, quite the concert. Those people are kind of weird, though. Weird? I thought they were totally normal for the 80s. Mm, yeah. So, Ben, what would you have done differently? With the keyboard? Yeah. Well, I should have done more to like hide the top of the keyboard. Mm -hmm. The enclosure took a long time to build anyway, so you know, sometimes we don't have as much options as we want. Also, you see that slot there? That was gonna be for the amplifier but then it hit the keyboard, so I had to put the amplifier oh. over here. Um, it was fun making it from the ground up using all discrete logic, so there's no microcontrollers or anything in this. It's all logic. So, you know, you could have built this in the 80s. All these parts were, you know, existed back then. So you said that this isn't actually tuned. Is there a way to tune it? Yeah, um, you just use all these oh, potentiometers. Okay. Yeah, so there's um, four octaves, and this one is 12 notes per octave. So okay. yeah, you could sit there and tune the whole thing. We just haven't done that yet. Okay. Um, there's a few of the pots or the keys, like this key, the rubber on it has never really worked very well. Mm. So I don't know, that needs to be fixed. But it turned out pretty well, and it's actually quite loud, just with that little yeah. power supply yeah. and amplifier. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Have you ever done an 80s themed music mod? Let us know on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Ready? And we don't need this part. It's the day the music died. Now it's time for the Atari 2600 version of Jurassic Park. Don't you mean time to die? 
The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.